This talk is entitled Catholicism in Korea, and it was originally given at my uh, parish church, uh, St. John the Baptist in Newburgh, Indiana. I would like to begin this presentation with the question, who is Stella? And you can see there's a young Korean woman down here. She's uh, being baptized, and they traditionally uh, baptize with pouring from this little, uh, what looks like a little teapot. And uh, here she is on the right at Mass, and oftentimes uh, Koreans will, will still wear veils when they go to Mass. So, so who is this woman? And you may be surprised. You may know her. So think about it for a second, about who she is. Well, there's a good chance you uh, have heard of her, but by this name, Kim Yona, because she uh, is a famous figure skater, a gold medal uh, winning figure skater for that matter. And if you watch very carefully, sometimes uh, before she actually begins her program, she'll cross herself. And you, you can't quite see it in each or either of these pictures, but she actually wears a rosary ring when she performs. And in a sense, this is kind of the face of modern Korean Catholicism. Uh, and this is a very famous and very open Catholic who was uh, baptized at the age of 18. Now I want to show you another face of Korean Catholicism. On the left, one of these two men, uh, I'm not sure which, is a, um, is a man named John Chong Ik. And on the right is a picture of him as, uh, as a uh, bishop. He became Bishop John Chong and he was actually a classmate of our own father Joseph Ziliak. Uh, they studied under Karl Rahner together in Germany. So I think this is just an interesting connection our own parish has with Korean Catholicism. Now before going into the history of Korean Catholicism I need to say a little bit about where it is in the world. And as you can see from this map Korea is a peninsula that extends um, out of Asia uh, and it has China and Japan as its neighbors and this could make things very uh, difficult for Koreans because it was a very strategic place whoever controlled the peninsula uh, could threaten the other country so if Japan controlled Korea it could threaten China if China controlled Korea it could threaten Japan now fortunately Korea was able to stay maintain its independence for most of its history uh, it did fall under Japanese colonization from 1910 to 1945 but that has been an independent country. Now unfortunately today it's actually two independent countries, uh, North Korea and South Korea, the Communist North and the uh, Democratic South. And if you ever go to Korea, it's, it's a very beautiful country, but it's, uh, it's about 80 percent mountains, so uh, you're always walking up or down, <laughs> and so it's a good place uh, to get some exercise. And Koreans actually joke that if their country was to be uh, hammered flat, it would be as big as China. Now Catholicism came to Korea during the Chosun dynasty, so I want to talk a little bit about what this dynasty was like. Uh, it lasted from 1392 to 1910, and one reason it was able to, this is a very long time, right? Uh, this is over 500 years that this dynasty was able to last. And one reason it was able to last so long was it consistently chose stability over progress. And there was, in Korea, rather than having uh, a kind of attempt to make society, to grow the economy or to advance society there was a tendency to try and keep things stable to try and keep things nice and even and keep things the way they were and this is reflected in the very hierarchical nature of Korean society uh, at this time uh, there was a very strong kind of class system where you had gentry on the top followed by commoners and below them were artisans and below them were merchants and you also had and you the way you reinforce this, there were different there were rules about what kind of clothes you could wear, how big your house could be. Uh, there were very strict ways that, of speaking. Uh, you you couldn't speak the same way you could to someone above you that you could to someone below you. Uh, and this is actually preserved today. So, for example, there's a different verb used to say that my father is sick as opposed to my friend is sick, or that my father is eating as opposed to my friend is eating. And there were also people who were completely outside of the social system, such as slaves and outcasts. And these people were beyond the pale. You didn't have want, want to do anything, uh, want to have anything to do with them. And, and examples of outcasts would be people like butchers or Buddhist monks or shamans, uh, that sort of people. And about the only kind of status mobility you had was downward. You couldn't really raise your status up, but you could fall down. So, for example, if you were a member of the gentry and uh, one of your relatives committed treason, you could be made into a slave. 
and commoners could actually would actually at times sell themselves into slavery because slaves didn't have to pay taxes and uh, you of course you had to feed your slaves so they would do it in order to to basically stay alive in the korea the thing you wanted to be the most was to be a government official that was considered the highest status position and in order to be a government official you had to take exams and you had to pass three exams in order to become a government official now in china the exams played a role allowing uh, upward social mobility so in china if you were really really smart commoner you could actually take the exams and pass them and become a powerful government official and there are cases of this actually happening in korea though the rule was that you could only take the exams if in your among your ancestors you had someone who had uh, served as an official position so what this meant was you couldn't only the people who were descendants of officials could become officials so you didn't really have this kind of status mobility upward status mobility now Catholic Christianity because of its emphasis on equality of course challenged this whole system and said no that we have this kind of basic spiritual equality you can't really treat people badly just because they're of a lower class and so forth and this was a challenge to this uh, system and caused Catholicism some some difficulties I should also say a little bit about the uh, religious environment during the Chosun dynasty there was a lot of uh, different religious traditions people could choose from uh, there was uh, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, and Shamanism being the most important and uh, people wouldn't go around saying well I'm a Buddhist or I'm a Taoist or I'm a shamanist they would typically uh, go to whichever religion suited their needs at the time so for example if you needed a, if you thought you were being bothered by a spirit uh, you would call in a shaman to exercise that spirit if you were uh, wanted to have a child born uh, you would go to a a uh, famous Buddhist temple that specialized in that sort of thing. And men in general tended to follow Confucianism, whereas women tended to follow more Buddhism and shamanism. So there was often, well, there was some crossover, there was kind of a division between the uh, religious life based on gender. Now, the state followed a kind of Neo Confucian orthodoxy. Basically, this was the big religion. Even though it tolerated other religions, they couldn't cross this religion. So if they disagreed with it or, um, or didn't follow its kind of dictates they could find themselves in trouble because the state uh, essentially claimed the ability to control religion and my uh, advisor professor Don Baker at the University of British Columbia has termed this ritual hegemony and what this means is that the state based on this kind of neo-confucian orthodoxy claimed the uh, right to determine who could perform what ritual when and where and who couldn't perform different rituals so basically the state, uh, be, the Neo-Confucian state could control, claim the, the right to control religion. Now, okay, I, I use this term Neo-Confucianism. There's a good chance you've heard of Confucianism, but you maybe haven't heard of Neo-Confucianism. Well, Neo just means new Confucianism, right? Well, what, what do I, what's old Confucianism? Well, old Confucianism, uh, it's interesting that there's an element of the worship of heaven uh, sim and the heavens kind of understood as a deity similar to God but the real emphasis in Confucianism is on human relationships for example there's five cardinal relationships and these are the relationships between uh, emperor or the ruler and the ruled the father and son husband and wife older brother and younger brother and friend and friend and there's lots of rules about how you should these different people should interact there's also an emphasis on, on virtue especially as the tradition developed on a filial piety to your parents and on loyalty to the sovereign. Now, as I said, in traditional and ancient Confucianism, there's a belief in the existence of spirits and of heaven that you can interact with, but you're, you're, you're not supposed to get too close to them. And they're not all that central. The main central point is on human relationships. Now, Neo-Confucianism, this, this new Confucianism, goes so far as to allegorize heaven. It says, well, all those old lines in the Confucian classics that talk about heaven as a, as a deity, as an anthropomorphic uh, being that has emotions or that has a will, that's, that's all just uh, allegory, they said. It's actually heaven is just this kind of impersonal movement of this impersonal uh, universe of this uh, interplay between what they called Li and Qi, this kind of principle and material force interact together to determine what are proper relationships. But it's not a deity uh, that, that has a personality. It's not a personal god. So it, it basically allegorizes heaven.